Breaking news. This just in. Bloomberg has reported that Bitcoin will hit $500,000 in a super cycle this coming bull run. And that is going to take a lot of liquidity, a lot of capital injections. In fact, $16 trillion of capital coming into this crypto altcoin market. And in this video, guys, I'm going to show you those altcoins that are leading the pack. All right, guys, if that sounds good to you, make sure that you like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. If you're new to the channel, what's up? Welcome. My name is Kyle Chasse. I've been in crypto for almost 12 years now, bringing you guys all the alpha, everything that you need to know to take full advantage of this upcoming, just confirmed, Bitcoin and altcoin super cycle. All right, guys, let's get into it. So the first thing I want to do is say thank you guys to all everyone here who's new, all the new subscribers, everyone who's been tuning in. I'm very, very, very happy to say that I've one of the fastest growing crypto channels in the entire YouTubes. Um, so, you know, right now we're averaging about 890 new subscribers a day. So thank you guys. I'm really, 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 really humbled and happy that you guys find a lot of value. That's 6.23 thousand subscribers a week on average right now. So again, thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. I very much appreciate it. And uh, I'm really, really happy you guys are finding value in this content. So before we get into this crazy altcoin uh, narrative that we're about to talk about, uh, which is absolutely insane. Uh, literally, this is just p uh, posted that and this is, you know, for, for you guys, we were talking about this in the last video that I made. Was it the last video I made? I don't remember. One or two ago where we talked about the cycles and where we're headed. You know, we're going to see a super cycle, which if you don't remember, if you didn't see that video, make sure that you go watch it. Um, but it, we talk about a super cycle in the, the fact that it breaks all the previous laws of what technical analysis would say on the trajectory of an asset class. So normally people say that it's gonna be law of diminishing returns. The super cycle, which Bloomberg now agrees that we're headed in that way, um, breaks those laws and we see greater returns than expected. And I really truly believe this is where we're heading. And guys, if you didn't see my post on X on, I believe it was Friday, I think this is what led um, into that this is one of the big clues that led us into, and guys, if you aren't following me on X, make sure you do that, at Kyle underscore C-H-A-S-S-E. And uh, you can see here that Grayscale filed the first ad for Bitcoin ETF with the SEC. We're almost there, I said. So you can see this is, so what happened is Grayscale, the day before they made this, uh, this filing with the SEC, they went and had a meeting with the SEC. So what do you think it tells you when Grayscale is, who's filed, one of the applicants for the Bitcoin spot ETF, when they go have a meeting with Gensler and the, the gang over at the SEC, and they go the very next day and file this, this is an advertisement. When you, when you want to advertise a security to the world, you need to file with the SEC and get approval and sign off for this for offering a securities. But this is Q&A, what happens when the GBDC uplists to New York Stock Exchange as an ETF? And you can see that this is an ad for Twitter an ad for LinkedIn, and there was some more, I, I don't remember here, but that they you know, Facebook and everything else too. All right, guys, and just so you know too, um, very, very good uh, trade. If you guys follow my trade on how to 2X your, and also go watch that video, I'll link it in the description below. If you haven't watched that video, this was the easiest play. Uh, you can see I'm already up uh, $17,000 on my trade right here that we made. You can see I bought, started my long here, and it's just been <laughs> up only. And man, applause for Bitcoin. It's just been ruthless in, in the bull trend, right? Uh, even when you get little pullbacks here, it just gets bought up real quick. People are just, you know, afraid. Like, and if you're selling Bitcoin in this market, what are you doing with your life? Seriously, what are you doing? Um, so I also felt like, just so you guys know, I also felt like a Solana trade would be good right here because if you look at this chart here, Solana seems to have bottomed out. So I decided to do the same thing I did with Solana as I've been doing with Bitcoin. It was a low leverage, 5, 5x uh, leverage trade here. And uh, you can see that I bought uh, longed here and it's down, you know, uh, 50 cents or so since I, I did it. So, but because it's a low leverage, see, I can, I won't get liquidated until $49. I think this is not happening. So I think that there's been a cool off. What's been happening, guys, is a lot of the liquidity from all the altcoins. If you look at the altcoin market today, it was down significantly across the board, which gives you some great buying opportunities as well, because we know that capital rotates from Bitcoin to major caps like uh, like Ethereum. And I also think Ethereum's incredibly undervalued right now. Solana, things like that as well. So I decided to do the same kind of move on Solana. I'm not down right much, very much right now, 4%. You know, that's a, on a 5X leverage, it's down less than 1% since I, I bought into it. So I think that this is, I think we've maybe found the bottom somewhere around here. Maybe it goes down a little bit further, but I think from here, it's going to find another leg up once the altcoin momentum starts picking up. So 
I'm in these two trades right now. If you guys are interested in trading with me and going into my VVIP group, I think we have now about 125, 130 people. Welcome to all you guys who are, who are recently in there. But that's where we give you all kinds of trades, alpha, insider information. Um, in there, I posted Research Coin first, which Research Coin, Research Coin has just absolutely blown up. That's the uh, the one that's you can see here that some of the altcoin calls that we've had. You can see some of the big ones here. Um, you know, like. Solana up 236% or 200% even at today's price. Banana Gun up 188%. Link up 113%. Research Coin, since I mentioned it in the VVIP group first and then on this channel, up 365%. Guys, BCB up currently almost 500% since we mentioned it on the channel. So, um, and even the ones that are up less, even like OTC had a was a nice pullback today. This is one that I would be looking to get into right now. Uh, OTSEA, SEA, because you can see that it's only up 36% right now from the time I called it, but up all-time highs is 149, so a nice pullback here. Um, but everything else has been doing really, really well, except for Rollbits, not not doing so well. But um, essentially, Rollbits had a bunch of big, big buyers who were in very, very early, who were dumping and, and taking profits and probably rolling that into smaller caps, as I probably would have done if I had those enormous profits they did as well. So guys, congratulations if you've been following this. We've been doing extremely well with the calls on this channel. Uh, very, very happy for that. Okay, now... Now we're going to get into the narrative of what the show is about today, a $16 trillion narrative. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. Um, we will, and if we could have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial uh, seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. Welcome to the game of blockchain, ladies and gentlemen, and real world assets. So you've heard me talk about this before, but real world assets is something that I continue to hear every single day. If you guys don't know me, I'm a venture, I'm a VC. I also, I'm also a builder in the space. We're building paid network, which has been absolutely on a run as well for very good reason. Um, Commonwealth, Fluid AI, and, uh, and some other things that we have in the works that we can't announce yet. But I'm constantly in the game these circles of people who are talking about things and real world assets just seems to be a narrative that I hear everywhere I go. And so when you look into it, the market seems to be responding to that as well. Now, when it comes down to real world assets, listen, it's not my favorite category to talk about, but just because I'm not super excited about a category doesn't mean I don't think it can make a lot of money. And I think that a lot of you guys are here to make a lot of money. And so let's get in and start talking about that. You can see here, that real world assets have had an absolute explosion when uh, since, since in this year. Now, I'll tell you guys a quick story. Back in 2018, um, you know, late 2017, early 2018, there was this narrative that was going around. It was everyone was saying like, "Oh, blockchain, not, not crypto," and blah 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 blah, and like tokenized securities. And I invested in this company called Securitize as well. You know, and the thing is, in the securities uh, token markets or real world assets, there's just not a lot of liquidity. And so you can see back over here in 2018, nothing, 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 a little bit here in 2022, and then boom, explosion in 2023 to where we are today in about $5.8 billion uh, of real world assets here in TVL. So um, you can also see the different, different protocols here that make up the majority of it. Now, yes, okay, here is one of the things that a lot of this is essentially, so Maker is leading the pack here with 2.79 billion in tokenized T-bills. That's a good use case. It's not as good as this like, um, as a staked USDT as that's kind of like, meh. But you know, then he starts to do some real ones, Ondo and Matrix and Real IT. Um, tangible is one that I wanna call out. I'm not doing, I'm not mentioning today's video, but I will say that I am a private sale investor in Tangible. And I, even though today it seems very quiet, I've been in touch with the founder and they have some really big things on the horizon. Uh, so tangible is, is something I'm bullish on, but it's not something I'm covering today because there's not a lot of news right now, but I just know that they're working on some really, really big things. So when it goes down to the world, real world asset kind of Dune, Dune dashboard here, you can see this is the kind of narrative that we like to look for, right? I talked about it a lot on this channel's analytics. We'd like to see, we like to just not, just not look at uh, the X timeline and figure out what people are ch talking about. We like to go and verify things for ourselves, And so we can see, the, the kind of charts, you know, ever since the beginning of the year, this is up and to the right. This is going to explode because we have something different here, guys. I, I need to tell you, we have something different than we have ever had before. We have a lot of these guys, buttoned up, suit type of guys who don't understand utility tokens, but what they can get behind, like Larry Fink, is the idea of putting a, a 
company's equity and tokenizing that and putting it on the secondary market so it's easy to trade back and forth. Uh, you know, taking um, you know stocks that weren't uh, easily liquid before and tokenize you know tokenizing those, tokenizing you know fractionalizing ownership of big expensive assets like real estate or art, for example, tokenizing that and allowing people to participate in that. Um, real world, instantaneous, real time dividend payments from equity and companies, for example, things like that, bonds, securities, all kinds of things. These are, it's a $17 trillion market. Now, in the point of this video is to show you guys the different protocols who are leading the pack in that. And I still believe because there's not a lot of attention on this yet, that these things could be some of the biggest protocols in the world. And hearing about them today makes you very, very early. Some of the ones that we are talking about today, um, but you can see that here we've got Goldfinch with $100 million in loans. Uh, Ma Maple with 85 million, Clearpool 281 million, Centrifuge 227. So again, you, you want to see these kind of charts in a narrative, right? You want to see it's up and to the right and growing, uh, up and to the right again, growing charts, growing charts. So everything, the trend is looking very, very friendly here, guys. Um, you can see also here the holders of real world token assets was 27,860 a year ago, 52,000 of. Uh, 572. So you can see this is still small, right? Like in a lot of projects, there's 52,000 token holders or way more, right? Like I don't even know that, but Shiba or Doge has like a half a million or a million holders, right? So it's still incredibly small. And one of the things that I need to prerequisite this video on is I'm just not sure about the timing. So do I think these things are going to explode in the next month or two? I don't know. Because a narrative is very strong. A narrative is stronger than, fun, than the actual underlying fundamentals of a project. Uh, one of the examples I can give you is Uniswap. The token is worth so much money, billions and billions of dollars, but there's actually no value accrual within the token. So it doesn't make sense, but it does tell you how, par how powerful a narrative is and people's perception of a protocol and its value. Like People are trading Uniswap specifically based on the presumption of what it does, even though the underlying token today has very little value. That could change in the future. And that's the interesting thing about this as well. Even though I'm going to criticize some of these projects today a little bit, and the fact that today there's not a strong token utility or use case, it doesn't mean that, that can't, they, can't, you know, they can't focus on that in the future on bringing more utility and more value accrual into the token. So to give you an idea of how massive this industry is, Right, so each one of these squares, guys, each one of these squares represents a billion dollars. So DeFi market, fifty-five billion. I'm oh, sorry. So each square is a hundred billion. <laughs> so DeFi gets half of a square. Cryptocurrency in total, this is a little bit outdated, right? We know it's now like one point four trillion, but anyway, the rest is pretty revealing, right? Gold, ten point nine trillion. Now look at the, the, the magnitude. These are all stock markets, global real estate, derivatives, insurance, global trade, global advertising, gaming. These are all real world assets that could come online in the form of tokens and liquidity injected into our overall cryptocurrency space, right? And these are things, these are, these are either financial instruments like stocks, tokenized real estate derivatives, or they could be companies, for example, right? Like stock market for once. Um, so, it's a massive, massive, massive narrative. The question is, when is it coming on board? Now you can see here that this is a report. I forget who did it. Who was it? I think it was, uh, let's see, who was it? BCG, Boston Consulting Group, right? And they come down here and they say that tokenization of global liquid assets estimated to be worth $16 trillion business by 2030. So the question is, is it gonna happen this bull run or next bull run? And the answer is that it's already starting to happen. So I was going to talk about Goldfish a bunch, right? And the reason that Goldfish caught my attention was simply because of who's behind it. You so say you've got A16Z or Andreessen Horowitz. You've got Coinbase, Variance, huge fund. Uh, yeah, basically these guys. And then like the, the rest of them are, are pretty big as well. But huge backers. Now, the problem that I had with, with Goldfinch, and if anyone from Goldfinch is watching or anyone can correct me wrong here, I don't see a real token utility. However, here's the point I'm gonna show you of what, what my point is, that even though there's no clear token utility, the narrative of real world assets has popped this thing up 324% in the last 30 days. So 
for a company that's backed by Andreessen and Coinbase and Variant, for it to be sitting at $105 million market cap, I think it's still a pretty good opportunity. But I, I, I'm just making this full disclosure right now that I would like to see them focus more on token utility. So what I will talk about today is Maple Finance. So Maple is essentially an institutional capital marketplace on chain. It's basically just making an institutional DeFi product that we already have. So on Maple, credit professionals manage fast-flowing lending businesses where capital is syndicated and lent to institutional borrowers to fund business growth and operations. Maple is the only on-chain marketplace focused exclusively on serving institutional and individual accredited investors with high-quality lending opportunities to suit their liquidity, risk, and return requirements. So again, this is why... This is why I'm not so excited on the space from a personal perspective. If you guys know me, you know that I'm a hardcore decentralization maxi, that I love decentralized permissionless protocols. And when you get into real world assets, you're mostly talking about centralized companies that have a token for some use case or another, right? So let's let's talk about really. So Maple was founded in 2019 by a, led by a team of former bankers and credit investment professionals aiming to approve upon legacy capital markets. Maple is an institutional capital network that provides infrastructure for credit experts to run on-chain lending businesses and connect and connects institutional lenders and borrowers. Built with both traditional financial institutions and decentralized finance leaders, Maple is transforming capital markets by combining industry standard compliance and due diligence with a transparent and frictionless, frictionless lending enabled by smart contracts and blockchain technology. Maple is a gateway to growth for, institutional, for financial institutions, pool delegates, and companies seeking capital on-chain. So they have a big, you know, you can see that they have this huge uh, partner network. They're making a lot of uh, partnerships and traction on that front. So that's good to see. Um, yeah, quite quite a bit. Reap I use for my banking and credit card stuff, even though I don't like to. <laughs> they've got some. They have they have a couple of uh, solid audits. It's very important when you look at any of these things that they've got good audits. And basically, what Maple is, guys, is it just it's a it's a it's a lending protocol, borrowing lending, where it's peer to peer. So but the peer-to-peer, -peer, where in DeFi, traditionally for us in permissionless, you have any single person in the world, accredited or not, institutional or not, can be a liquidity provider for the loans, and they can earn interest on that. And then borrowers can be whoever they want to, and they typically, in Aave and things like that, over-collateralize. So Maple has the ability to do that as well, but they've got different ways that one can actually take loans. And uh, I'm not going to go into it, but I just want to show you that. And you can see that in the, uh, in the past 30 days, it's up, it's up 98%. And there is some sort of um, clear use case here I'll get to in a second. But you can see they also have a really good uh, cap table here. You've got, <laughs> well, not SPF, but they did, make it, you know, they did make some good investments. But anyway, you've got Framework Ventures, BitScale, the Lao, Polychain Capital, Framework again, Framework coming in all three rounds. And you, know, you can see that they had to do a down round here. So which at least they were able to raise money, which means they, were, they probably were... Uh, so it seems like here in 2021, they raised at $200 million valuation, and then they had to come raise a bit more money to keep, keep the lights on here, and they just did that. So they raised another $5 million, which makes me feel confident that they're get that. One, if these guys invested, you know, especially guys like Framework and things like that, um, and Block Tower, for example, Maven 11, very, very good uh, VC firms, then they've, done, they've looked at the numbers, and they were comfortable to put another $5 million in it just a few months ago. And so they've got, they can keep their lights on, which is very, very bullish here. Now you can see, let's watch a short video. What does Maple do better than traditional banks? So the two main things that Maple does better than traditional banks are the aggregation of capital. This is because it truly occurs across a global uh, layer of infrastructure on the Ethereum blockchain. And then the second thing is actually facilitating loans around the world. So uh, because Maple occurs on this digital infrastructure, we're able to pull capital efficiently, uh, create loans efficiently, and then manage, uh, you know, manage the repayments uh, far more efficiently than a borrower would, would get by going through a bank. Okay, so he, he just said a, a whole lot without saying anything. But essentially, he was describing the use of a blockchain, saying and and a global network. And this is, you know, this is this alone. He's basically saying Maple is a bank, but instead of the bank itself, a centralized bank being the one who will authorize a loan and underwrite the loan on Maple, uh, anybody can a pool of people will underwrite a loan. Usually, the, the, they'll assist, assess assess the risk, 
and then they will pool capital from anyone in the world as long as they meet the, the different res restrictions. I'm sure they can't be from like sanctioned countries. They have to maybe be accredited from the United States, et sec, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the thing about Maple, why I chose it in this one is because there is some utility for the token here. So Maple is a governance token of the Maple Protocol. It enables holders to participate in governance and earn fees. Maple inherits the ERC-20 token standard uh, and token behavior from ERC-222 for profit distribution of the USDT, USDC treasury for Maple. So the Maple treasury earns portion of the fees generated by Maple protocol. For the full scope, please review the fee section. On a periodic basis, Maple holders will be able to vote and use the fees earned for the, by the treasury. And the main options are... so. This is the thing you have to ask yourself, who are the majority of Maple holders and who is the people voting on what happens with the fees? Is it going to be the founders themselves or is it truly the voting here truly happening by, you know, people who are holding the tokens? And if it is, then hopefully what they choose to do is distribute fees to, uh, to Maple stakers, essentially. So we'll see. Um, now, you can see that it has very, very good metrics here, guys. Again, what we like to see here, here is up and to the right charts and uh, monthly protocol revenue. So obviously, we want to look at revenue. It's still very, 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 very low. If you look at something like Rollbit is generating like million dollars a day or $2 million a day or whatever, this is nothing, right? Like this thing is like, it's making $25,000 a day. But again, this whole real world asset thing is super slow. And when you talk about permissioned protocols, it's such a pain in the ass. They have to onboard every single user, right? One by one, and they have to do AML and KYC and check where your money came from and check your wallets and blah, 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 blah. It's just a slower process than anybody permissionless be, permissionlessly being able to come and use something. However, when these things catch on and you land some really big clients, one giant whale of a client could be as valuable as like 10,000 retailers or something like that or more. And so it can pick up exponentially from there. So it is pretty interesting. Now, guys, Chintai is, is claiming to be the coin base of the securities token markets. So basically what Chintai does is it allows anybody, and they're, they're offering this to retail soon, um, so they're building an entire marketplace of framework, the legal side of securitization of tokens, equity, bonds, whatever. And they also have an exchange to allow people to trade those assets as well. So they are branding themselves essentially as the coin base of real world assets. And they have two licenses as well. We'll get into that in just a second here. But who is Chintai? So Chintai has created a comprehensive blockchain platform that modernizes capital markets for asset managers, banks, and enterprise. It is a one-stop regulatory compliant platform for tokenization of trading of real world assets. Any asset class can be tokenized and subsequently traded, including equities, bonds, real estate, carbon credits, just to name a few. Business, business partners can optionally stand up for their, stand up their own branded full featured portals for issuance and trading using Chintai's extensive white label service. So let's look at this. So it's, it's claiming to be, and uh, I don't have the, Coin market cap on open, but just so you know um, that this is not accurate. The numbers here, it's actually around $65 million uh, total market cap right now. But if you think about that compared to like Coinbase's, you know, multi-billion dollar market cap, okay, it's pretty good, 65 million compared to that. But again, again, you're, the whole thing here is we're talking about centralized companies that have a token. So the question is how much value accrual will happen to the token? With Coinbase, there is no base token, at least not yet. Right, and so we know that if you own stocks or shares in Coin, in Coinbase, all the value capture goes back into those equities. Uh, this, on the other hand, it's kind of unknown. But you can see here that maybe the marketing is doing really well. They're up six hundred percent, six hundred twenty percent in the last thirty days. So, but still at a sixty-five million dollar market cap, that's not bad. Again, it's a real world asset, uh, real world asset narrative absolutely taking off right now, guys. Hi, my name is David Packham. I have 20 years of experience. And sorry, I'm laughing because I just think that this guy's, he needs to, like, if you're running this, if you're running this very, very coin bait, like, just please get your suit tailored. I think this suit is like two or three sizes too big for him. David, if you're watching this, all the love, brother, all the love, just saying. Experience in traditional finance, founded two blockchain fintech companies, 
and served as a board advisor on two others, so I know all about the staggering inefficiencies that exist in private capital markets. Despite rapid technological advances across all the financial landscape, private capital markets remain plagued by middle and back office inefficiencies. These prevent many smaller asset managers, SMEs, and average people from accessing the wealth generation opportunities these markets could offer. Now there's a solution. Shintai is a digital fintech platform that uses blockchain technology to streamline private debt, equity, commercial real estate, and more. This allows rapid issuance and liquid markets to be deployed, all on top of a red compliance framework. By automating redundant processes like manual reconciliation and handling of corporate actions, our solution can reduce administrative overhead by up to 75%. Our platform also Sorry, I can't even finish it. It's it's so such a boring narrative to me. But again, just because it's boring to me doesn't mean that it's not going to be incredibly valuable one day. And again, the point I'm, that why I'm making this video, guys, for you is because it was hard for me for a while to like cope with the fact that that this our industry, my beloved industry, our industry would be regulated one day up the yang ying is yazoo and that you know and, and it's a fa and, and it's true and I, I and like i said before in many videos you know reg a proper regulatory framework is beneficial because it allows people to understand what they're buying on the secondary market a lot of tokens trading on you know coin gecko or coin market cap or dex whatever they're not proper utility tokens they are they are actually uh you know revenue sharing what what any what most uh regulators would call security tokens and I think it's 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 important that we classify them as such, and also make it easy and streamlined, like this guy is talking about. Because if you have a company, a centralized company, and you create a token that have, offers revenue share, well, that you know you're not it's not a utility token. You're you're creating tokenized equity essentially and paying out dividends, and people should understand what that means because then people would understand that hey. You know, okay, company X generates $1 million a year, and we're going to give 20% of that to token holders, and the rest of the 80% goes to the company, the, the shareholders. Okay, and at least you've got disclosure now and, and full transparency in what's going on. But today, we don't have that, right? People literally come in off the street. Maybe a lot of you guys watching this now, you will see a company that has a token and assume that if you buy the token, you're buying a share of that company. And that's not how it works. It's not how it works. But we need more clarification. So I do think it's important that this industry does evolve. So like I said before, what, what makes what makes Chintai unique is that they have two licenses. One of them is from Singapore. And the other one is from British Virgin Islands, which is coming very, very soon in December. So I think that, you know, that is one thing that gives them a, a big head start. And it, the fact that they're based in Singapore will give a lot of exposure to the Eastern Asian market which is exploding and super wealthy you got korea and singapore singapore itself is just so rich right so much money there and so i do think this is going to evolve and i do think that it's the time has come where this narrative explodes and i think that's how we get to this five hundred thousand dollar bitcoin the question is is how quickly will it evolve and if there was assuming enough liquidity so you could tokenize a building right but then how much demand is there and how much is liquidity is in the market, right? This is the big question and that we still don't know because Securitize came around a long time ago, the company I invested into, and they started tokenizing things in like 2017 or 18, but there was just no liquidity on that, right? So anyway, but the interesting thing here is you do have a fully distributed supply and uh, so very little inflation here to come. And it says it's actually deflationary by 5%. A 5% of fees earned used for buyback and burns and 10% of the fees earned by Chintai from issuance, trading, account maintenance, go toward yield for, sh for checks staking. So if this thing explodes and they become the coin base of real world assets and it's just producing massive revenue, then at least 10% of that, they'll at least 5% go back to buyback and burns, very nice. And 10% goes back to anyone staking the token. So again, this is a revenue sharing protocol here, not decentralized by any means, right? Just so we get that clear. So Chintai highlights, uh, so Chintai Nexus is a comprehensive one-stop real-world asset platform built entirely on chain with checks resource tokens powering all transactions. Over three years of development to support white-labeled RWA issuances across any asset class with an AMM exchange to trade real-world assets 
and automated geofence regulatory compliance monitoring using AI technology. And then this is interesting, retail access target. So this is what I've been looking for for a long time, really, right? And it's something that the United States really desperately needs. You need a framework where anybody can come and in a, for a cheap and quick way say, hey, I'm minting a security token. It's gonna cost me a thousand bucks. And I have now I have a place where I can trade it legally within the framework, you know, and if you're trading securities tokens, you need to be KYC'd and you need to do all this stuff, right? But it's needed, it's absolutely needed. So there is real use case here. All right, guys, the next one we're gonna talk about is called Clearpool. Essentially, the Clearpool is, why I like it quite a bit here is that you have both permissionless products, which is always my, always my favorite, and then you also have tra um, then you also have institutional grade DeFi. Now, so this is what I've realized a lot here, guys. And this is a very, very, very clever. And hmm, let's just say that the things that we've been building, I've been thinking about taking a, 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 a also a similar approach for a while now. So what does that mean? That means that they use one tech stack to make two products. One of them permissionless with a utility token that services retail around the world. And then another product using the same tech stack that has KYC, AML, fully regulated, and uh, and then has probably a different revenue stream as well, institutional grade DeFi. And then what I would like to do in things that we're building, make sure that the, the, that the institutional equity side of things of the company have a fee essentially that they pay to go back to the token pro the token side of things that actually creates buy pressure as like a licensing fee because um, and the things that we've been building anyway we build around a hundred percent value accrual within the token and that's also where our investors have invested into the token model and all everyone's buying the secondary market so we want to make sure that that's always kept in our mind and so I believe the right way to do something like this is have the for profit equity side of things pay a licensing fee to use technology. Uh, and that licensing fee can be paid in whatever, but it's used to buy that token in the open market and put that within the token ecosystem. So uh, you can see Clearpool has amazing investors here. You've got Sequoia, massive, Arrington, massive, Sino, massive, Hashkey, massive, Wintermute, massive, huge investors. Gives me a lot of reasons to be bullish on this. I like that they're multi-chain. And uh, it's, it's again, it's, it's another, still, I haven't seen a whole lot of uh, other types of Products. This is again another borrowing and lending platform. It's very very straightforward. I also really it's a really, very very appealing market cap here of 32 million. Uh, fully diluted is 72.5, but it, I will it is worth saying that all the private sale investors you can see here somewhere. Where is it? I don't know where it is. Uh, yeah, it, uh, somewhere in here. But I, I read it earlier. Private sale was in 2021. It was like a one or two year vest. Um, everyone's out. All the private sale investors could have sold already if they wanted to. Um, but I, I do like here how they have it on their their docs, the transparent buyback and burns. So as you can see, quarter three, 2022, 100% was burned. Q4, 100% burned. Q1, 2023, 90% burned. 10% back to rewards. 80%, 20% back to rewards. So nice ecosystem here where they are using the revenue to buy back. Uh, read about more. Going forward, 50% of revenue will be used for buybacks and tracked below as usual. So this is uh, probably the best out of everything we've mentioned today as far as the way that they're using revenue for token buybacks and burns, which is probably going to put the most upward pressure. It's also one of those valued ones. That's something we talked about as well. It does have low trading volume, and I believe it's probably not traded on any major exchanges yet. Let's see. Yeah, so no major exchanges yet either. Uh, so we'll see how this evolves, but... Uh, anyway, it's probably one of the the best as far as value so far. And um, okay, and the last thing I want to talk about, guys, is so Chainlink God sums this up very, very well. When people think about tokenized assets, they think of trillions of dollars worth of assets in the global financial system that can be converted into on-chain format. But when many people, what me, what many, what many people, <laughs> but what many people don't realize is tokenization will grow the financial sector exponentially thanks to the creation of deeply liquid and global markets for previously illiquid assets, not to mention the increased access to global investor pool of capital, including people who have historically not had access to financial services, that's billions of people. Furthermore, entirely new categories of financial assets will be born into existence thanks to unique properties of tokenization. These are future asset classes we can't even imagine today, similar to thinking about the future internet use cases in the 90s, 
Trillions is on the trillions is the floor, not the ceiling. And this graphic says it very, very well. Essentially, you've got banks, institutions, blah, 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 big different chains. And CCIP is infrastructure that connects everything. And when you send a message or you send value across chain to chain to chain, guess what? Chainlink takes a little small revenue of that and puts it back into the token ecosystem. So even though Chainlink is far, valued far higher than anything we've talked about today, it is the best overall meta play if you want exposure to the real world asset narrative without having to go into one specific project. All right, guys, I'm going to put some cards up here. If you guys want to find out more about tokenization and Chainlink, click this video up here. And I'm not sure what the other one is, but you should click it because it's probably going to be better than this one. All right, guys, I'll catch you on the next one. See you later. Bye-bye.